Howdy. Welcome to season one, episode five of the CHC podcast, a new podcast about congenital heart defects brought to you by Anna Jaworski and me, her co-host. My name is Joe Flowers, and like so many of the guests on Heart to Heart with Anna and this podcast, I'm a heart warrior. On today's special Mother's Day show, we'll visit with Anita, a single mom to two energetic boys, and Misty, a single mom to two beautiful girls. Join us as these two incredible women share their stories. This is the CHC Podcast. Here we are with episode five of the CHC Podcast, and I'm so excited today. This is our Mother's Day special, and I have two very special mothers with me. I have Anita Moreno Marcello, and I have Misty O'Leary, and I'm so excited to have them with me today. I'm going to start the conversation with my dear friend, Anita, who I have known, golly, Anita, 25 years? We've known each other a long time. How long has it been? That makes sense. It could be more than that. Yep. Yeah, I feel like we've always known each other. So Anita wrote for my book, The Heart of a Mother, a million years ago. We actually put it out in 1999. So we've known each other quite a while, haven't we, Anita? Yes. I was hoping you could talk to me and to our listeners about Gabriel when he was born and tell us a little bit about his heart defect and the kind of support you had when Gabriel was born. Gabriel was born on his due date, December 20th, 1989. And when he was born, he was not diagnosed. So we had no idea he had a heart defect at all. We brought him home. He was home for three weeks when we had been referred by his pediatrician to cardiology and they discovered that he had very serious heart defects. But in those days, they really didn't even have as much ability to be sure of the diagnosis. So he was originally diagnosed with tetralogy of Fallot with some endocardial cushion defect and mitral valve problems. So it was a long journey. Uh, They handed me a book that was put out by the American Heart Association for children's heart defects, and his wasn't in the book. It had to be drawn by the cardiologist. And we really didn't have an internet, so we had no way to really know much. He underwent the toxic Blaylock shunt when he was three weeks old. And then when he was a year old, he was supposed to have corrective surgery for the tetralogy of flow. And when they opened him up, they found that he was a single ventricle. And they had no idea. Wow. It was a big year of lots of shocks and news that was hard to really get a grip on because we weren't in the know. We didn't have a way to really connect with other families even and know what we were dealing with. Yeah, it was a different world in the 1980s compared to what it is today. And I know my child was also not diagnosed until after birth, not three weeks, but actually two months old. And By that time, my baby was already in congestive heart failure, and it was really scary. And like you, no internet, no real support. How did you get information aside from that one little American Heart Association pamphlet? Was there anything else? When he was in the hospital for his second surgery, which turned out to be a hemifontan, And they'd only done it once before at that hospital and only a couple hundred times in the whole world at that point, we found out. It was so very new. And Gabe was in ICU for a long time. So at night, I would go into the surgeon's library and just rifle through things. And I actually found books with information on the Fontan surgery and the requirements for a Fontan to be successful. and. The surgical secretary copied those pages for me. I still have them, I'm sure. And I met with his surgeon and I said, if he doesn't have all these 10 
features, what does this mean for him? So it took a lot of work and it took me trying to investigate to find out things that just wouldn't have fallen into my lap otherwise. You were a very strong advocate for Gabe from the very beginning. Yeah. Did you have a medical background, Anita? Because when I started doing research, my son was initially diagnosed with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And just like you, there really wasn't much. When I went back home, I found an American Heart Association pamphlet. And that pamphlet said that all babies with HLHS died in infancy. So that was not very helpful to me. And like you, I went to the library. Now, I didn't go to a surgical library. That might have been more helpful. But I went to the Perry Castaneda Library at the University of Texas at Austin, which is where I was working on my master's. And I just copied everything I could find on HLHS. But I found it really difficult to understand a lot of what was being said in those articles. Did you have trouble understanding what you were reading? I did. I honed in on what I could. Like I say, there was a really clear article saying a child needs to have these 10 perfect features to really be expected to do well over time. I knew by reading about it that they hadn't been doing it all that long mm-hmm. and that there were aspects of those characteristics that I had no clue what they meant had to do with pressures in the lungs and all this. Mm. I had no medical background. I just had a baby who was dependent on me. Yeah, exactly. And it's amazing what we tiger moms, (laughs) (laughs) what we can do when we have to try and protect our babies. And my husband was a nurse. So I brought home all these articles that I copied at the PCL, and he checked out medical textbooks from the library at the hospital he worked at, and we sat down and tried to understand all this new lingo for us, all this cardiology language, Yeah, it was a huge challenge. I remember saying to Frank, oh my goodness. If it's this hard for me when I have a master's degree in education and you have a degree as a nurse, how hard is it for those 19-year-old kids we saw at the hospital? And Frank said, yeah, I know. And that's why we ended up writing our first book on hypoplastic Mm -hmm. left heart syndrome. It was imperative to me to put something together in plain English where you wouldn't have to have a master's degree to try and understand it or go to a library that you might not have access to. So I just feel like it was a different world back then, don't you, Anita? It was a different world. People today can't quite relate to the fact that we didn't have cell phones. Mm -hmm. I remember getting a pager at one point where I could actually go to the grocery store and have the peace of mind of knowing they could call my pager if they needed to get a hold of me. Otherwise, I would be in the dark. And various communication issues that were everyday issues. But it was not until Gabe was six before we got the internet, and I was just all over the place looking for things. Yeah, I remember Alex was two when we got internet. And it was dial-up. Do you remember the dial-up, Anita? Oh, yes. (laughs) I would have to dial that over and over again, yes. I know. Oh my gosh, it was such a different world. Let's talk real quickly about some of the stressors involved with having a baby with a critical congenital heart defect. And for those who are listening who don't know, a critical congenital heart defect is a heart defect that requires open heart surgery in that first year of life in order for the baby to survive. So both Anita and I had babies with critical congenital heart defects, or what's also known as CCHDs. Yeah. Was Gabriel your only child, Anita? No, he had an older brother who was three years older than he was. Mm -hmm. And we moved out from our two parent family home when Gabe was 10 months old. And then he had his Kemi Fontan second surgery when he was a year old. So a lot happened in a short period of time, a lot in the family, and then a lot centered around him. He was in the hospital multiple times that first year because 
he had TED spells. He would turn completely blue. If he cried, his whole body would turn blue jean blue and his arms and legs would pull into his chest and his eyes would roll back. It was really shocking and hard to live with. I had to quit work. I had to try to keep him from crying. Yeah. So no wonder they thought he was a Tet baby because if they call them Tet spells, those are spells that you frequently see with children with Tetralogy of Fallot. He did have the pulmonary valve that shut off. Mm. So he did have that aspect of Tetralogy. He just had way more than that. Yes, (laughs) he did. So learning about it was one thing. Living with it was another. We didn't sleep. I had to give him medication every six hours around the clock from the time he was about two months old when he started having those spells. So I would just be falling asleep when my alarm would go off that I needed to give him a dose. I'd need to be up with him. I just had no sleep. And it was a rough time. I remember having a lot of just really bad muscle spasms in my back and my neck. And I still needed to pick up my baby. And it was hard to be by yourself in that spot. By this point, you were divorced, Anita? I was separated initially. Yeah. You were separated. Yeah. yeah. That does make it so hard. And were your parents living nearby? Did you have any help from grandparents? My parents lived in Oregon, and when my son was diagnosed with the heart condition, my mother took early retirement, and she made it a point to come up for two to three weeks at a time every few weeks to help me because she could see how much work it was and how much I needed help. So I had that help ongoing from her. And so I would make all my banking appointments, dental appointments, any other appointments I had to make for when I knew she was coming. The kids looked forward to it because she was a really good cook and she was really <laughs> another wonderful lap and big hugs. And yes. Really important to help me. I was sometimes just really tired and struggling. Sure. So I wanted sure. my kids to have a good life. And it was hard to pull off in those situations sometimes. And nobody is as warm and loving and comforting as your grandma. I know. It was a great asset. And I will say we were very fortunate. Absolutely. It sounds like your whole family pulled together. Talk to me about the older brother. Did older brother help out in some ways? Or was that just another stressor for you, Anita? My older son was a budding violinist. So he had quite a schedule playing violin and studying violin, even as a five or six year old, he had quite a schedule. So I was really busy with Gabe with a lot of medical appointments and Jaime with a lot of violin, but they were good together. They were good playmates. And that was really helpful. And when Gabe had his Fontan surgery at two, And I was by myself. Mom had been there for a long time. She had to go back home. And Gabe needed to have a Broviac line for medication. And Jaime would help me to distract him so that I could do a sterile dressing change. And he was just very important to how we just managed to get through it all. Yeah, I remember one of the things that you and I had in common was that our sons were three years apart in age, and it was our second son that was born with a heart defect. And I think in some ways that was such a blessing for both Mm -hmm. of us, because I know that Joey and Jaime were able to normalize things for their little brothers, and they were able to make funny faces at them or hold their hand when they needed it. And I know when I was doing speech therapy with Alex, because Alex's vocal cords were paralyzed in his second surgery and his diaphragm was partially paralyzed, it was Joey who was doing all of the lessons that I was trying to teach Alex. And Alex, of course, wanted to copy everything Big Brother was doing. So he was the best assistant I could have ever asked for. 
Yeah, we had birth to three therapies for Gabe because he had a stroke early on. And Jaime was a very big help with his brother. He had a keen sense and he normalized the regular relationship part too. They Mm -hmm. squabbled and played rough and did all the things that they would otherwise probably have done. Did it terrify you? Because I remember when the boys were rolling around on the floor, just being terrified. My kid had his chest open twice and here was his big brother on him and i remember one time saying joey be gentle joey and he said mom it's okay this is what we're supposed to do (laughs) yeah yeah there was a learning curve for all of us the chc congenital heart conversations podcast is a presentation of hearts unite the globe or hug and is part of the hug podcast network Hug is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to enrich the lives of our community members. For free CHD resources, please visit our website at congenitalheartdefects.com. You are listening to the CHC podcast. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at the CHC podcast.com. That's Anna at the CHC podcast.com. Now back to the CHC podcast. Misty, it's so lovely to talk to you again. You were on Heart to Heart with Anna way back. I think it was 2015 when you came on Heart to Heart with Anna. And I see you on Facebook every now and then, but it's been a long time, girlfriend. So it's so good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on my new program. You're very welcome. I want us to start by talking about your heart defect, because unlike Anita, you're the one who has the heart defect, not your child. So can you tell me what you were born with, if you don't mind sharing what year or at least what decade you were born and what surgery you've had? Yeah. So I was born with Tetralogy of the Low, Blue Baby, and it was 1977. I was, oh, a couple days in the hospital and the doctor said something was wrong. Yeah. Way back in the 70s, it was not uncommon for a woman to give birth and for a mother and baby to stay in the hospital for a couple of days. Unlike today, where you have a baby and boom, you're out the next day. (laughs) It was a different world back then. Yes. So your mom had no idea before she was giving birth that she had a baby with a heart problem, right? No idea. No. Once they found out there was something wrong with my heart, they had me go to Denver. And that was kind of tricky where we live at the time. It was over the mountains and high altitude. It was tricky. Oh, gosh. The first eight months of my life... Eight months is when I had my first open heart surgery. They went in and repaired my VSD and put a patch on it. Yeah. Okay, so eight months of age. Did you have any other surgeries after that? Oh, yeah. I went in for numerous catheterizations when I was a kid. My next open heart surgery, I was 23. And back in our day, we were told once we had the surgery, we're fixed, good to go. That wasn't the case. (laughs) And I learned later on. And so at 23, I had my first valve replacement. And then second one was in 2013. So I'm going on, what was it, almost 10 years this year with this new valve. And was that a pulmonary valve replacement, Misty? Yeah, my pulmonary valve was replaced both times. Yes. And I have four stents in my pulmonary artery. So yeah, I take numerous medications to be here. Okay. So you said something to me that I have heard over and over again on my Heart to Heart with Anna podcast. And that was, oh, she's fixed. (laughs) I've heard that so much. And people are like, no, but everybody thought they were fixed. And I think part of it was that nobody knew any different, but the older you got, you had to have been feeling a little bit tired or winded very easily or something to know that you needed that valve replaced. Were you seeing a cardiologist regularly or only when you were experiencing great problems? No, I saw my cardiologist yearly. So once a oh, year. You? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mayo, you're good to go until I wasn't. <laughs> I saw a new <laughs> cardiologist 
that year. And he was like, oh, by the way, that's why you're tired. That's why you're having a hard time breathing and you're out of energy. And this is what we're going to go ahead and go in and do for you. And that was startling, but that was like my new venture on being a CHD patient, learning everything that I could at that point. And that's when you were 23? I was. That's a tough time to all of a sudden be confronted with something that you had lived with all of your life, but that really didn't slow you down. It seems like until you were 23, you were pretty much living a normal life. Am I right? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. So you're 23 years old. Were you married? I was married and I had one child, my oldest daughter. I had her at 19. So I was a young mom. So she was almost four when I had my valve replaced. Talk to me about having a daughter at 19. Did you tell your cardiologist, I'm married, I want to have a baby? (laughs) Or did you tell your cardiologist, guess what? We're having a baby. (laughs) Guess what? We're having a baby. (laughs) And he was not happy with me. I bet he wasn't. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Had he had any other patients who had a heart defect, like Tetralogy, who actually had a baby? He really didn't say. He just said, this isn't the best idea, but we're going to watch you carefully and monitor you and hope for the best. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Anita wrote for a book that I put together in 99 called The Heart of a Mother. And the woman at that time who wrote the intro to our book was a great-grandmother with Tetralogy of Fallot. So I know it could be done, but scary, really scary, Misty. So it seems like your pulmonary valve was okay when you were 19, but what is really common with TET patients is that those pulmonary valves wear out. Yeah, they do. And so yours only lasted four years after you had your baby before you started experiencing problems. Now, at that point, you had a toddler. So I'm sure you were kind of wondering, am I so exhausted because I have a toddler I'm trying to keep up with or what's going on? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So your cardiologist said, no, it's not the fact that you have a toddler. The pulmonary valve has worn out. What were your options? Surgery. That's all I knew. That's what he said. Surgery. We have to replace your pulmonary valve. And then he gave me the options of what that would look like and how to go about it. So I did. Within two months, I went in for the surgery and put the new valve in. So were you given the option of a porcine valve or a mechanical valve or what kind of options were you given? It was either porcine, mechanical, or a human And so I chose the human. Oh, so did you have a cadaver? I did have a cadaver. Okay. I understand that's a tough choice to make. And at 23, you were so young. What guided you to make the decision you did? Just research and prayer, honestly. Like, what is this going to look like for me as I get older? How many more surgeries am I going to have to have now to replace this again? All the factors. And the cadaver would be the easiest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've had that valve for 10 years now? I had that valve for 12. And then in 2013, I had to have a new one put in. And the new one is the transcatheter valve. You had the Melody transcatheter valve. So that was done in a cath lab instead of open heart. Amazing. Look at you. You've actually seen medical history in the making, haven't you? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yes, I have. It was fifth in the state to get it. So I was pretty excited and <laughs> nervous. And it's yeah. been the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. Yeah. So your recovery for that one, even though you were older, was probably a lot faster than the one that you had in 2013, right? So much easier. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I was out of the next day. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Next day, I walked right out. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. How awesome. Yeah, big difference. It is amazing what they can do in the cath lab nowadays. And so many fewer infections and, wow, a much faster recovery period. Okay, the fifth in the state. Gosh, Misty, you're a pioneer. (laughs) 
or a hamster, but I'll take either one at this point. <laughs> oh, I love you so much. You're so funny. Okay. <laughs> but let's talk about motherhood for you because it doesn't end with Melina. <laughs> you had Melina when you were 19. I did. Tell me about your more recent baby. I have a four year old daughter now, and I was 40. When I was chosen to become a mother, 41 when I had her, let's see, I got divorced right around that time. And yeah, I did the pregnancy all by myself. It was quite a shock, to be honest. I didn't think I was able to become pregnant. I had lost three babies previously. I'm miscarried so sorry. That. And so that's okay. It was tough, but there was a reason. There's a reason for everything. And she is the biggest blessing in my life for the second oh. half of my life. So, yeah, was she easy? No, my pregnancy was really tough. I had to be flown to Denver. She was a placenta previa, and I went into heart failure because of the transfusion that I ended up receiving to keep her inside. And so I ended up going into heart failure. I had to be flown to Denver, which is oh, three, four hours away. Oh, and I had to wow. stay at the university for four months by myself to keep her inside and be able to have her. Oh my goodness. Did you have some assistance from other family members? My oldest daughter was actually finishing up her bachelor's at CSU. So she was an hour away. So she was my only go-to person. Yeah. Wow. When I had you and Malena on Heart to Heart with Anna, you girls look like sisters. (laughs) (laughs) You were very young when you had her. and. We grow up with our kids. No matter what age you are when you have your children, you grow and learn with them. Don't you think, Misty? Definitely. I am sure she must have been so tender and caring towards you while you were pregnant with this baby. She was amazing. She was my right hand, to be honest. Yeah. she. Aww. I can't say enough amazing things about her and how she helped. Yeah. yeah. It was very blessed. What was she studying when she was in college? She graduated with her bachelor's of social work, and then she finished up her master's at DU. And now she is a lawmaker and policy advocate for the state of Colorado. Oh, my gosh, Misty. You must be so proud of her. I'm very proud of her. She's done very well for herself. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. How does she feel being big sister to a sibling who's so much younger than her? Loves it. Biggest blessing for her, too. (laughs) Crazy, our life has worked out this way, but I left her a legacy, so now she has a little sister. Okay, so let's be honest here. Is she really a big sister or more like a second mother? (laughs) Kind of like a second mom. Yeah. (laughs) But they do fight. When they're together, they do. They'll sit there and argue. (laughs) It's so funny. So there's that, too. There's a balance, I think. Yeah. You got to have a little bit of that sibling rivalry, no matter what age difference you have, don't you think? (laughs) Yeah, 22 years apart, totally fine. (laughs) So tell me what it's like now. You're in your 40s. You have a almost five-year-old little girl. What's it like being a heart warrior and raising probably a very energetic little girl? (laughs) I am tired a lot. (laughs) I try to balance what I'm doing for the day. I'm the breadwinner. So I work and I take care of her. And I am blessed. I have my mom who now lives with me because I help take care of her as well. She has some health issues, but she's my balance. So I'm able to leave my little one with her while I get to go to work. So that makes it easy. Everything else, it's a little different and tougher thinking of the future and having to make sure that my health is good so that I can be here for her. So that's a little different. This later in life, having a little one that I have to be here for. Yeah. So you're in that sandwich generation where you're taking care of a little one and helping to take care of your mother. And yet mom's also taking care of grandbaby and taking care of daughter. (laughs) (laughs) Like a symbiotic relationship, right? Definitely. (laughs) That is so awesome. So what do you think is the biggest lesson you have learned 
being an older mom, but with a congenital heart defect, and also watching your mom age as far as just living your life the best way you know how, Misty? I think that's it. Living it the best way I want it to be now and really being mindful of my health way more than I ever was before. I always took care of myself, but now I have to really do that for my little one and even for my mom because I'm the one person that they depend on for everything. So I have to make sure that my happiness within myself, I'm very mindful of that in this part of life. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You girls are both such beautiful women. I'm so blessed to have both of you in the studio with me today. Thank you. Thank you. What I was hoping with this last segment is that we could talk about what family and friends can do to help families, especially when we are living with a CHD household. And Misty, I'd like to start with you, honey, because you grew up with a CHD. And I think sometimes it's hard to know how we can help people. People don't want to feel like they're prying or that they're butting in where they shouldn't. And yet there are certain things people can do that would be really helpful. So can you tell us some things that you would find helpful for other people to do since you're living with CHD? I think just being mindful of my time and when to ask for help, I guess. I'm they usually know if I'm not feeling good, I wear it on my face. Mm-hmm. I'm really bad with I'm fine. I'm good. I got the world. Because I've always yes. been I got the world and it's okay. So I think it's more of me, honestly, the having to be like, I need help. That is a very hard thing for me to say. And I don't know if that's a whole CHD complex that we all have, but I'm really bad at that. So I think just asking and being there. I think those two are helpful. Yeah. I think it's a woman thing. We women think that we have to do it all and we have to be everything to everybody. What about you, Anita? What's something people can do to help you? And are you like Misty and me? Do you find it hard to ask for help? I think it's always been hard for people to ask for help. I think the thing that people need to know is that You don't have to have solutions or some special statement or anything that you're specifically trying to offer. You can reach out and say, I'm here. I don't know how to help, but I would like to know the best time to check in with you to see how you're doing. If there's anything you need, what I can do. Can Mm -hmm. I help with the other children when there's Mm -hmm. a doctor appointment i had friends who came when we were at the hospital and picked up all our clothes and took them home and washed them and brought them back oh that's so sweet i didn't have to tell her that Mm -hmm. she just did it we were there for 25 days it was huge Mm -hmm. and it was extremely helpful just the little things but being in touch in a way that just says I'm really nervous because I don't know what to say to you, but I really want to let you know that I'm willing to mow the lawn or pick up something you need or whatever, even when there's no big surgery going on or no big event. I'm here for you. Just don't be afraid. Reach out. And for the person who needs the help, you don't always have to have something. You can just say sometimes you just want a five-minute conversation with someone other than. Little one, 
who doesn't have yeah. adult conversation. I'm totally there with you. I was a stay-at-home yeah. mom. And poor mm-hmm. Frank, when he would come home from work, I wanted somebody who could yeah. use multisyllabic words with me. <laughs> That's always good. It is. Yeah. And just somebody who can commiserate with you if you didn't have a great day, because sometimes things don't always work out the way we want to. The baby throws up all the food that you got in them, and you're so worried about it being a failure to thrive baby anyway. And now they just threw up everything you gave them. I mean, we go through and some that's hard time. eating issues are an all day long, every day. Yes. Agony for mm. parents. And so many of our little ones have that yes. or related sort of things. And they're exhausting. It is exhausting. It is exhausting. And then, especially if, like you were saying, where you have to get up and give medications, they have mm-hmm. to be given at a certain time. I don't know about you. I felt like I was asleep with one eye open because I was so afraid something might happen and I might miss it. Yeah, I think my son was about four years old before I ever had a full night's sleep. And that's a long time to go. That is a long time to go, especially if you're a single mom. Yeah. (laughs) How can you work like that? Oh, my goodness, Anita. And you worked outside the home. That's got to be so rough. Uh, I just yeah. can't imagine it. I just can't even imagine it. And you're the breadwinner and you're providing insurance. So it's not like you really had a choice in the matter. Right. And we all get through rough early years because it's those beautiful faces that we're looking at every day that keep us propelled. But we'd go back to it in a second. I yeah. would. That's what I love, too, is you look at that sweet baby, especially when they are asleep and they're Mm -hmm. freshly bathed and powdered and you look at them and your heart just sings, doesn't it, Anita? Yeah. And it's gone so fast. They grow up so fast. I miss them very much. Yes. For those of you who don't know, sadly, Gabe passed away and such a sweet soul, such a gentle sweet competitive (laughs) yeah loved his video (laughs) games (laughs) but he was an artist he was good so creative so creative love nintendo yes he got to visit there at the end which was great it's really something just amazing and remind me how old he was when he passed anita he was 27 that just doesn't seem possible No, (laughs) it really does not. And like I say, I I would do it all over again in a heartbeat. And that's a funny and ironic statement to make. But yeah. Yeah, I know. It was probably some of the hardest days of your life. And yet you'd go back there in a heartbeat. I think what's amazing is that he's been gone for years now. And yet I still feel like he's with us, Anita. He very much is. Absolutely. He pretty much is. And he's had a great impact on me, on my life and my thinking and my outlook. And he was all about raise money for congenital heart disease research. And he would say, but for the babies, mom. Oh, yeah. yeah. Such a sweetheart. I still yeah. feel Gabe's presence very strongly. I know he's watching over us and. I'm thankful that his heart and my heart warrior's heart brought us together because we've been friends a lot of time, Anita. Yep. I'm so thankful you came on this program. Thank you for helping me with my brand new podcast. This is great. It is great. And it's always good to talk about Gabe. Yep. Misty, it has been so good catching up with you, my dear, and actually seeing your little precious Surprise. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. It was wonderful catching up with you, too. (laughs) Folks, happy Mother's Day. And I appreciate you both so much. Thank you. Okay, so that does conclude this episode of the CHD podcast. This is a great way for us to celebrate Mother's Day together, especially for the challenging situation of being a single mother. You all are amazing. 
I love and treasure both of you. Joe, I'm so happy that I had a chance to talk with my dear friend, Anita, and my dear friend, Misty. It's been such a long time since I had a chance to really chat with the two of them. But now I get a chance to talk to you about this episode. And you have a special connection to these women in a totally different way. Since you're also a single parent, Joe, I'm sure you were able to relate to some of the stories the ladies talked about. Share with me parts of the episode that really resonated with you, Joe. Lucy's story impacted me, obviously, because she and I are both heart warriors. She's grown up with it. I've grown up with it. She's had kids and had to raise them. I've had kids and I'm raising kids. She's doing it as a single parent. Now, let's be honest, in my world, when my divorce became final in May of last year, my kids are mostly with their mom. I get them about half the time, but I'm just blown away by the strength that Misty shows being able to take care of two kids. As a heart worry, I'm tired all the time, Anna. It's exhausting being a parent, first of all. But then you've got a heart condition on top of it where your oxygenated blood is mixing with non-oxygenated or whatever the case is for your particular heart condition. That's what is true for mine. And we're not able to get the kind of oxygen and energy that other people normally would. And so see her doing so well is just absolutely inspirational. Yes, I'm so inspired by Misty. I think it's interesting how the two of you are right at the same age. You're both heart warriors. You're both yep. single parents right now. And it's not easy. No, it's not easy at all. I think one of the things that really inspired me with both Anita and with Misty is the involvement that both of them had from their mothers and how both of them turned around and have administered care to their mothers. It's really been a symbiotic relationship. And I just think it's so beautiful to hear these stories of how one generation helps out the other and then they turn around and give help back. How did you feel about that, Joe? Yeah, well, it's a beautiful story hearing it from their side. That's something that I think as a CHD patient and knowing what my parents went through with me, it's absolutely needed. That bit of support is needed. Mm -hmm. from the family all around. Yes. So, Joe, I thought it was really interesting at the end of the show when I asked Anita and Misty about things that friends and family can do to help them. What did you think about how they were talking about how hard it is for women to ask for help? As a heart warrior yourself, do you find it hard to ask for help? You know, that's a really interesting question because we've talked on heart to heart with Anna about my addiction with alcohol and drug abuse and how that has affected my CHD growing up. We don't ask for help as addicts. We don't naturally go out and try to find help. In fact, we become a recluse. We pull away from people because we know that what we're doing is not going to be viewed as something that's good. And so when you've got that combined with the congenital heart defect, for me, it was really hard to reach out. As we've discussed on your previous podcast with my addiction, it was hard to ask for help through that part of my life. Now that I'm beginning to take more control of my CHD condition, it's not as hard to ask for help. Because people know me. The good thing for me is that I don't often have to ask for help. They know who I am. They know what I can do. They know what I can't do. And I think being open, honest about our CHD is the best way that we can allow family and friends to morph into our lives and understand how they can help us better. Absolutely. When we ask for help, we are allowing ourselves to be vulnerable to somebody else. And through that vulnerability, we build a stronger bond. It seems ironic, but that's the way it is. And that's why it's so important to let your guard down 
and to allow yourself to be vulnerable to somebody else so they can be strong for you. And then when they need somebody to be strong for them, they know they can turn to you. I think that's something a lot of people don't want to appear vulnerable to anybody. But that's where you will actually find your strength is by being vulnerable to others. So with that, Joe, I think we'll go ahead and end this really informative Mother's Day edition of the CHC podcast. Friends, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed talking to Misty, Anita, and Joe. Please join us next month for Season 1, Episode 6, where we'll be talking with dads in the CHD community. I'm Joe Plowerst. And I'm Anna Jaworski. And this has been the CHD Podcast. Thank you for joining us. The CHD Podcast can be heard wherever you get your podcasts. Visit us on Facebook or Instagram to continue the conversations. Join the Hearts Unite the Globe Patreon group and become part of our town hall meetings. It's simple. Just visit www.heartsunitetheglobe.org and select the tab that says Donate to Hug with Patreon. Then you too can be part of the conversation.